I made that decision and said, I can't go around these people under no circumstances. I would rather walk a thousand miles barefoot in the rain than walk one step on the prison track. America, often referred to as the home of the free. However, the United States has more incarcerated people per capita than any other industrialized country in the world. 2.2 million people are currently held in federal and state prisons under ugly, draconian, mandatory minimum sentences. Most people in prison are not hardcore criminals. Three strikes law. We have to utilize the laws in ways that direct public safety, and that's why we're trying to be smart on crime, not just tough on crime, because tough on crime has done nothing. Bill Clinton's crime bill. If you have any feeling for humanity, then you want every human to have a certain baseline level of existence. That's not what happens right now. The war on drugs. It's an assault on poverty. All have contributed to the spike in the U.S. prison population. The rate at which the citizens of this country are being incarcerated is astonishing and sometimes criminal. And when the individuals of this country are sent to prison, it's justified by the idea that prison rehabilitates people. But does it? With the national recidivism rate of 68%, the revolving door of ex-offenders returning to prison has created an epidemic. But what is the cause of such a high rate of recidivism? Is it the offender's fault? Has our prison and correctional system failed? Do the laws have to change? I had both parents. Uh, shortly after my parents separated, my father went to prison for about a year. I felt the void when he wasn't there, but I also felt the void when my mother and him split up. And that's when life kind of changed for us. My parents were teenagers and my mother and father weren't together for as long as I can remember, quite honestly. I came up in a single parent home. My mom raised me, um, had a bunch of uh, uncles, and aunts that assisted. It's kind of like a village, you know, it take a village to raise it. Back in the day, they say take a village to raise a kid. It took a village to raise me. My father was murdered in a drug deal when I was three. Um, I was in the house when it happened. And my f mother was a junkie and a prostitute in and out of systems. And I entered pro foster care probably for the first time before three. Periodically, I grew up with both of my parents. Uh, my father would come in and out and my mother was pretty much the sole provider who we could depend on. Even though I had both parents, we're still in the hood, you know? So I, I did that, I had both parents. I didn't have, have both parents growing up. For the most part, my dad was in and out of jail. My mother did leave me in a box when I was six weeks old. I was actually adopted um, by my aunts and my uncle when I was six weeks old. Uh, my biological mother, she unfortunately was addicted to crack cocaine. A place like Gowana's Projects, you've got 14, 18, eight-story buildings where a lot of poor people who don't have jobs, who are underemployed, uh, are living together, and success usually breeds success. Poverty usually breeds poverty. And in my community, uh, having a body, meaning killing someone and going to prison, was a badge of honor. That was like, if you graduated high school or graduated college, these are what the young men knew that they had to do in order to survive. We're sent out of our house. We walk down the street past drug dealers, past, you know, prostitutes, crack vials, you know, two different instances I remember going to school, there were dead bodies that we actually were walking around that the police hadn't even gotten sealed up. My father, my natural father, he was murdered when I was 14, so he was the last. And the impact of it was, if I think about it, it was that I understood that the world was a very aggressive place. I grew up in aggression at home, so I, I knew my home was aggressive, but they reinforced the understanding that the world in general was aggressive and that I had to match and exceed that aggression. So I think that the insanity as a whole that I, was, that I grew up in set a stage for my life in a completely different manner than what most people would have experienced. I have this theory, you know, um, that human beings, we, we kind of 
forget that we are part of the animal kingdom and we behave a lot like animals. And even though in, in, in the figurative sense, like, like any animal that lives in the pack, there's always that dominant male. And he's, he's the silverback gorilla, you know, the, 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 the head male lion. And these pups or these cubs or whatever, when they, they, they as they grow and mature, they want to they try it out. And you know, that, that silverback is gonna get you in line until you're ready to go out and start your own. But when you don't have that silverback gorilla, you don't have that male line, then you have a younger version, a younger male trying to assert himself when he's really not ready. You know, and so that's that's I think I see that a lot in in humans because you have a lot, especially our you know young kids, and they're they're, they're feeling all this bravado and you know the testosterone flowing, and they don't have it, they don't have that silverback around to get, let them know you're not ready yet, son. You know, one day, but not two day. I was introduced to marijuana at probably eight years old. By the time I was in the seventh grade, I was selling marijuana, smoking every day. By the time I entered the eighth grade, I had experienced uh, cocaine for the first time. And <laughs> yeah, and as I experienced cocaine, I made a decision that with trying cocaine, it was a little too much for me. So I would wait till I turned 16 to try it again. And so uh, just growing up in that environment, it was, not that my environment was drug infested, but whenever my father would visit, there would be a presence of drugs. My life as a juvenile um, progressed in a rate that was almost like a movie. And what was crazy about it is, we understood the violence, we understood the crime, so to speak, but we didn't understand how to profit from it or how to make money off it or how to utilize anything. So we were literally just doing dumb stuff for the sake of doing dumb stuff. You know, one of the big things we did was steal cars and we stole a lot of cars. Uh, we found a guy over in North St. Louis that had a body shop or a chop shop or something at some point, and he'd give us like $150 for every car we brought in. Me and one of my partners back then probably brought in 100, 150 cars in two weeks. Like, if, if, it, if it wasn't, like if you weren't in it, we were taking it. I saw my parents working and struggling, and we were still in the hood. It didn't. And it seemed like to me that it was adding up to anything, so that was more motivation than anything to for me to get involved in the street and go. And uh, like I said, I seen my brothers, they were, they were living good, you know? They had just all the stuff that I was attracted to, so I was like, you know what, this is what I'm gonna do. Seeing the bus drivers and the police officers and different people in the community continue to live in poverty and in struggle led me to see the drug dealers and those who were hustling as people who had got the means to be able to uh, have the nicer things in life. My grandfather, he was sending to his ways that he believed that I should, that I was that, I was the first grand, grandson of the Humphrey side. So he looked at it like he's the next in line to do what I do because I see it in him. I got introduced to the crack game at, uh, at the age of, actually at the age of 13, but I really didn't start selling until after I dropped out of Job Corps. My father was a drug abuser, and I think what led me to selling drugs was in my younger years, my father sold marijuana. And at those few years of him selling marijuana, I seen him begin to have a better, uh, more finances. I made a conscious decision at a very early age that I was gonna be a drug dealer. I looked up to a lot of my uncles and stuff, and, and we was poor coming up. We was, very, we was one of those poor families. Um, my uncles, the transition, seeing them having chains, and, and they had exactly what the rappers run DMC, and them had on like L.L. Cool had on Troop, and Fila, that was stuff like, and then, you know, the different brands. And I seen how the girls seen it, and how it made status, and how much power they had moving through the hood. Like, I like, shit, you know, let me, let me. You know, so I stole, you know, my uncle had bricks, and took it to one of the older kids in, in Bradenton, Florida, and so I sold it at the time. So um, he said, man, where you get this from? Shit, you bang, I give you a thousand dollars for this, but if you give me one of these every day, I give you a thousand dollars. So that's how I started, like really just stealing. My uncle said so many bricks. I was just like, but I didn't know I was giving away a quarter key of cocaine every day for a thousand dollars. 
the whole purpose of being a drug dealer was to gain the finances that I felt my family needed to be able to come out of the poverty, impoverished situation that we were in. It was kind of like a learning process. I started like a mule. I started like a kid that's holding a walkie-talkie when cars come and they come in. And it, it was a whole family thing. Like outside, I was working for my family. Like it was real families. I was a mule. I go from Charles to Jacksonville with bricks on me. With, with my uncles, I could like he take me to school. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I'm going back to my mom's in Georgia. It was a, it's a family thing. You know what I'm saying? Most cocaine I trucked at once. Probably about a hundred, uh, probably about a hundred keys at one time, maybe. My mother went to jail multiple times. My brother, uh, my oldest brother did two bids in prison. My younger brother is locked up. Almost all of my male cousins, except for two, didn't go to prison from the New York side. My female cousins at the age of 16 had attempted murder cases on them. So there's my other cousin, she got caught coming back from Jamaica smuggling weed. So I'd say on one side of my family, maybe four or five people didn't go to prison. Majority of my whole family was in prison because on both sides of my family, my, my um, father's side and on my mother's side was into the drugs, into marijuana, into cocaine and crack when those arrows was hitting. So my grandfather was a big um, drug dealer back in the day. They called him Boss Hall. And my grandma, Gus and May on, my, on, on the Florida side, was a big drug dealer on that side. I fought a lot. And um, coming through my young adulthood ended up in prison. It was easier for me to get into a world of crime, just like it would be for you if your father were a doctor, to get into your father's practice as a doctor. Mm -hmm. It's easy because that's what you know. Going to prison wasn't a thought. Going to prison was part of what I knew part of my life would be. It wasn't even a, a question of if I would go to prison. It was when and how long. Like that was already embedded in my mind from all of my family members and my community of the men specifically leaving and coming back. So the first day in prison, I died. <laughs> so who you're looking at is not the same person that went, you know what I mean? Because I died. I tell people that all the time, but I don't think they really feel me. <laughs> you know, I think they think that it's like a, a nice analogy, but it, like it really happened. Okay, I was 35 when I fr first went to pr prison. They jack you up till you get butt ass naked every time, spin over, sp spread your cheeks. Like, that's, that traumatizes you, you know what I'm saying? Like, how long can I keep doing this before I break? Some people, it's not really criminality. Some people, they just did something and got caught and ended up in prison. Outside of that, there is no criminality, you know? A few years in prison, got a pretty good criminal, you know. I was at close to 30 when I got caught and I got started maybe at 19, seriously. So maybe about 10 or 11 a year or whatever. I get caught for, my, for conspiracy. I was facing conspiracy is 10 to life. They made it did about 10 years. That's why I got like a, like a nine year sentence. I was looking at 26 years for this initial charge but I was still selling drugs because I was out on bond. All of this is happening between the ages of 11 and 14. I think I'm, I'm, I think I'm brought in and charged at 14, and I actually wind up going in at 15, 15 and a half. When I went to juvenile, I was charged with 197 felonies. I don't know how it happened. I know that it was funny when we went to court because you know how they make you stand for the reading of the charges? They were like, everybody stand. They go to read. The judge looks at it and goes, y'all can sit down. <laughs> I was convicted of interstate trafficking in aid of racketeering. After 11 months of spending some really good time in prison, I was um, charged with conspiracy to launder monetary instruments, money laundering, and conspiracy to distribute five or more kilos of cocaine. 
My case was a $270 million cocaine conspiracy that involved Black Mafia family, otherwise known as BMF. There is a extreme degree of insufficient emotional maturity, especially, you know, not to, especially amongst our people, amongst our, the melanated community. It's a, a, a lot of like, especially amongst the males. It seems that around 17, 16, 17, they stop maturing emotionally, no matter how big, strong, or financially affluent they become, they stop maturing emotionally. That will always impact their decisions will always impact the outcomes in their circumstances. Going to prison at the age of 21, my first time actually being in prison. I've been locked up in the jail, but I never have been to prison. That experience was, uh, it was really something. Um, I could say, in a sense, it was kind of like a traumatic experience, not something that I could see, but something that I would experience later a mental thing, you know what I'm saying? You can make a bad decision and come out of it, but it's rare because when you go to prison for 20 years, you're not coming out the same. And anyone who tells me you come out of prison in any amount of time, the same is a lie. I mean, most most, most men that go to prison are gonna come out with PTSD. It, it's just a fact because stuff that you see in prison, you're not gonna see in the world, the normal world, it's like. If a person say they don't deal with any kind of, of uh, post-traumatic, Stress disorder from leaving prison, I don't care if he did one year, man. I don't care if he did one month. They lying. Because it does something to you mentally, man. You know, first of all, you're taking somebody out of their, out of their home from their family and their friends. That's traumatizing anyway. That's a punishment anyway. You're taking a man from his kids and, and telling him to see him one day and then they leave him on that weekend. And that's traumatizing. First, you got that. You got to understand that's PTSD now. You know what I'm saying? That's a form of PTSD. You're traumatizing the kids and, and the man that's in it. Think about this. If you lock a man up at 17 years old and release him at 33 years old, he's still 17 years old. Prison stagnates or stop maturity. And when you've been incarcerated, you see that men have not grown. They've grown in age, grown in stature, but their maturity level is still at the place that it was when they got incarcerated. So those who come out to be successful are generally somebody who had been exposed to success prior to going to prison. You know, now you can't tell me you're correcting a person by giving them, you know, I'm talking about people who were not violent, you know, people who just were like entrepreneurial and illegal you know, endeavors, and you give them 30 years. You have to understand that there's a business to have as many people locked up in these uh, facilities. And to me, each facility to have, should have some type of actual success, but prisons are not built off of success and funding. So it's about taxpayer dollars being used in a way that we're just throwing away because most people who go to prison have a 50% more chance of coming back. That's a problem for me as a prosecutor and as a taxpayer. What the people in the positions of uh, authority uh, representing the public's interest um, apparently believe is that the public just wants these people out of society. That's it. They just want them out of society. So that is what they focus on, you know? And if we can just keep them out of society, that's why they have such extraordinarily long prison sentences, you know, that don't make any sense. Many people think that a prosecutor's job is to put you in the system, right? They say that's your job is to convict as many people, but that's been the, the, the job that the law and order, tough on crime rhetoric has been perpetuated by politics. A true job of a prosecutor is to be a minister of justice, to pursue justice, not merely convictions. And that's in the duty and, and oath that we take every day as prosecutors, even the elected DA. And so my job, and I thought this way, not when I was elected to this position, but actually when I was a line prosecutor, I saw that we can do better and we can save more people if we give them an opportunity to get a job not when they get into the system, opportunity to get access to healthcare, 
opportunity to help that addiction, that going to a jail cell is not actually solving the addiction problem, it's actually perpetuating the problem, but we do nothing. And so I wanted to be a change agent and that's what led me to public service. As a former probation officer, I was responsible for um, monitoring people who were literally doing a sentence on the street. That's the best way I could say it. Because probation is literally, you should be in prison, but in lieu of prison, we're gonna give you these terms and conditions to abide by. And as long as you abide by these terms and conditions, you can stay on the street. Based on my observation, the correctional system is designed to control and contain, not correct. The prison system was created as an extension to, the, to slavery. And so when we think about specifically in America, what is the incarceration system? What is it meant to do? It's to perpetuate capitalism. It's free labor. So if you do one thing back in, let's just say, starting from the Reconstruction period, men and women were incarcerated for just sit vagrancy. They didn't have a job. They didn't have a place to go. So then they were charged for that. They were sentenced to that, and then often sent back to the plantation that they had just been freed from. So is it meant to rehabilitate? Absolutely not, because even to this day, it's a privatized system that fuels capitalism. It's a multi-billion dollar corporation. When you look at the historical context of, you know, uh, slavery and the slave uh, Jim Crow laws, that those were embedded in the criminal justice system. And so there's a history of that bias and racial inequality in the laws. And as prosecutors, we have to make sure that equal justice under the law. You gotta look at this prison system. Is a system that we still got those un underground railroad guys, those those Ku Klux Klansmen running the COs and, and, and people, and, and, and some 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 of these POs that want to see people life go back because their life miserable, miserable, misery won't come. You know what I'm saying? They hate to see a guy that was successful still look like he's gonna be successful. Like I look like I was still gonna be successful. Hey, I'm trying to make it hard for him. We need those people need to be evaluated and checked out and locked up. Many people think because you come from a single parent home or your parents have to be struggling or not have or not be in the home for you to go into the criminal justice system. What I saw is being in North City where poverty, concentration of crime, disinvestment is concentrated, even if you have a two parent home, people of color are more likely to go into the criminal justice system because it's set up for certain groups to fail. And what I learned is being a relative of someone going into the criminal justice system, that is not the solution for everyone. You know, I read I read a book once um, by the LA gang member, and he said something to me always stuck with me that um, there's there's a lot of black men who don't have time to think because they're so busy running, 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 and the first time they have a time to sit down and think is when they're locked up. So in Missouri one in three African Americans, and this is a report that the Attorney General of the state of Missouri puts out every year. One in three African Americans are stopped 93% more than any other group. In the city of St. Louis alone, 46%, 45% racial makeup of African Americans, Caucasian Americans in the city of St. Louis. It was a report put out by the Ethical Society of Police, that is the Black Police Union within the St. Louis City Police Department. They put out a report that says that the, the jurisdiction is relatively split evenly and over 80% of arrests are African Americans. So you do the math. This is not my statistics. That is the statistics of law enforcement that they put out every year. We're not addressing that. The unfortunate reality is the only people that take any type of care and concern in the U.S. prison systems are people that benefit from it or the people that have family members incarcerated in it. And the first thing to do to devalue, dehumanize, or villainize somebody is take away their name. You are an inmate, you are a convict, or worse, you're a number. It's not geared for rehabilitation. How can you rehabilitate anyone when you put them in a system that's surrounded by the same people that were doing the exact same thing and not allow anybody to come in that can give them an expectation? I think prison more fun in America you know, it's more punishment than rehabilitation. You can't 
possibly say you're in the business of rehabilitation and your mission statement is to help law-abiding citizens when you can find a woman, man, or juvenile for 23 hours, Monday through Friday, and you have one hour out, and then you lock that person down, sometimes without a shower, you slide their meals under a door where the rats eat off of the bottom part of the door and expect that person to be rehabilitated. If you're truly about rehabilitation, regardless of your sentence, then there should be programs to help returning citizens come out to actually not come back if it's truly about rehabilitation. But it's about the prison industrial complex. So then the only people that have a play in it are your large corporations that get free labor or your state programs that get free labor. So they come in, or worse, your for-profit prison systems or your for-profit bond systems. The system is set up that way, in my opinion, because it, you, they make money off prisoners. They make money off of beds at halfway houses. Um, they make money every which way, um, but they don't give us the resources to do so. They make all the money off of, off of the prisoners. But what I believe more than anything is the system is designed the, to self-sustain. Everybody's getting paid but you. You know, lawyers getting paid, judges getting paid, I'm getting paid. You know, we gotta buy chains, we gotta buy uniforms, we gotta buy basketballs. You know, if you can't see, we gotta get you to the, you gotta get you to the optometrist and buy your glasses, your, your tooth hurt, we gotta take you to the dentist and pull your teeth out. Something, you know, you, you got high blood pressure, we gotta take you to the doctor. You got dialysis, we running you there. You know, you need soap, toothpaste, you find religion, whatever religion, we gotta provide that 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 book for you, whatever that whatever that holy book will be. We gotta do all of that. It's, it's, and, and this is just on the uh, uh, this scale right here. Now you look at the, the 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 largest the largest scale, which is a whole country. You know, that, like a lot of people get paid off of off of people being in and out of prison, uh, in and out of the criminal justice systems. For one person to just get to trial and to go into the prison, it takes about 50 people. Right? In the city of New York, to incarcerate for one year someone, the city of New York, is $75,000. What are you doing to stop that person from coming in? And what are you doing to rehabilitate that person while you have them so that they don't come back and spend another $75,000 a year? Me getting all that time was uh, job security for uh, the Bureau of Prisons. Um, and all the staff that work there, and and more labor force. Like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't work in Unicor, but men do, men and women across America, in Puerto Rico and Alaska. You know what I'm saying? That's working in, in these prisons for a gain for these people. State-run prisons give prison contracts to several different companies. For instance, the company that owns the Missouri contract for commissary is Enterprise Leasing. There's also a company called JPay. JPay holds the contracts for phones that most prisoners use to contact their loved ones. JPay is currently listed on the U.S. Stock Exchange as a publicly traded company. It costs an average of $17 to make a collect call in 2004. In my opinion, I was sent to prison to be used for gain. I'm, what I mean is to you is used for gain because of the, the government, man, the money they make. Let's count the people by me taking you out the system because I'm working against myself when I'm trying to take you out the system. And I say, how many police when the incident happened showed up to, to arrest you? They say about five. Then I say, okay, then when you got charged, how many people were you, when you were processed to be held in jail, did you interact with? They were like, maybe about 10 people, 10, 11 people. I said, okay, let's count that. That's about 20 people, 25. I'm sorry with the math. 15. But then, you know, and then the prosecutor's office, we reviewed the case. So you have you're the elected prosecutor, you have, I have over 140 people in my office alone. So whoever touched, multiple people can touch that file, not just lawyers, support staff. So let's say about 20 people, and then you got the court personnel, you got the clerks, you got the, the sheriffs, you got everybody transporting you, doing all this stuff. That's an industry within itself. So over 50 people off of one case will be affected if you're not in the system. I don't think the, 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 the average person takes in consideration of how large an industry 
the criminal justice system is because when you start incarcerating people, you have to provide for them things that it, that they wouldn't be able to otherwise provide for themselves if they weren't in that situation. So, I mean, things that you may find small and minute, like a fingernail clipper, we had to buy that. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't bring one from your house. You know, so you have to, you like Q-tips, like every, like the, the most random mundane things now have to be purchased. And that's a, that's a lot of money when you, when you start adding up all the different things that have to be purchased. If you rehabilitate, you lose the economical uh, funding to continue to um, incarcerate. It's really difficult coming home as a convict or as an inmate and becoming a human again and becoming a father again or becoming a worker again. And when you're on probation, a lot of people, the unfortunate thing is the people that are willing to take the chance on you again are the people that seem to be willing to want to exploit you. Now you want me to pay you too to be in prison. I, and now I still got obligations to kids, child support, and now I'm gonna lose my home and my family because I can't even provide for them, but you want me to pay for you, and I'm still stuck in your job. It, it don't make any sense. It's backwards. The halfway house for me was, I'm one of the guys that did everything by the book, and it was hell. Everything in the health, halfway house was designed to try to send me back to prison. And I, I, I got on the bus, went to work every day, paid every, every week they told me to pay, and the counselors in their job was to try to send me back to prison. It made it hard for me, like, it made it miserable. System not set up for you to go straight, you know, it's set up for you to be, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's set up for you to recidivate. The system set up for you to recidivate because for the short time when I was in the halfway house and I said, okay, let me, I wanna at least give us a shot to go for the people that care about me that don't want me to be involved in all this and uh, I said before I tried to get a job, you know, I went to these, these places where I was pretty much begging for a, a job. I don't understand girls like you. Who gonna hire you with a charge like this? You just ruin your life. Now that goes back to what I was saying in the beginning. What if I wasn't, what if, what if I didn't mentally already know I'm gonna make it out of this? What if I would have taken those words that my counselor gave me? who's at a high position, who wears suits. She don't even wear the CEO outfit. You wear a suit to work and you tell, and you look like me and you tell me that nobody's ever gonna hire me because of my charge, that I throw, I throw, I throw my whole entire life away. So I feel like they can play a more positive role than they do. Now they look at you as a normal inmate. They don't look at you as a human being. They look at you like you're a monster coming from, they don't know what prison. They don't even know if you just been in a mini camp. You had 90 days and they treat you like you've been in there 100 years. So they treat you like you shit while you're in those halfway houses. This council wouldn't give me a pass and I've been doing anything by the belt. So my day, I had a meltdown. I'm beating on the glass like, hey, take me back to prison. Take me back to prison. You know what I'm saying? That's a mindset some of them get when they get in there. Like, I can't get a job, I can't do this in time. So they take me back to prison. Let me just do my rest of my time in prison. Then. When it was time for me to get released, the officer said to me, Grin, we're gonna save a bed for you when you come back. So I'm like, man, what, what is, how, come on, man, how you fix your mouth to even say something like that? No, uh, I hope you uh, be okay, I hope you make it, no number to call if you need help or anything like that. And the reason why, because the recidivism rate is so high. It felt free because I was able to get a job. I was excited about possibly rebuilding and saving all this money. And then it was like, Arr! I got my first paycheck and they were like, you got to pay us this. I'm like, why am I paying you, right? So I don't remember the exact percentage, maybe you do, but so it was 25% of my check, oh, yeah, of my gross, not, net. not my net. Gross. <laughs> Woo. <Yeah. laughs> so I felt defeated at that moment. I was like, oh, I should have stayed in prison for this. I literally said that. I was like, I should have stayed in prison. I should have just rolled out my prison. It's designed in prison that in order for you to even um, go home or get home early, you got to pay them. You got to pay them on your weekly check. Say you work at McDonald's this, and you make 150, you got to get them half of that 150. There's a lot of people that come home and will go get a job because they're a convicted felon 
you know, they'll make $10 an hour, but they got to give the manager $2 an hour for every hour they worked, or he going to tell the probation officer they weren't there, or he's not going to sign off on the papers. That's where this conversation of social justice has to be bigger than just how police police. It has to be how people are treated when they're in the system, as well as returning citizens coming out the system, because they should have something waiting for them. Like I, in Missouri, it takes 30000 a year to incarcerate someone. I tell them, let's give those same families 30000 a year up front to help address the, the, the inequalities of the broken systems, the educational system, the opportunities. And if we take that same 30000 each year that we can give somebody to incarcerate them, and because to be honest with you, as a prosecutor, it's sad. People where I come from, they have more opportunities in the jail cell than out free in the community. That's a problem for me. You're gonna get health care, which you've never had out in the community, because we don't have Medicaid expansion in Missouri. Um, you're not gonna get a piece of job anywhere. You got, at least you got a, some sort of a job in prison. You're gonna get three meals. It might not be good meals, but you're gonna get some meals where people on the street, they don't have meals out because they're homeless or they're food insecure. And actually you'll finish that GED or the high school diploma in prison because then th they give you those resources. Why is it till you are in the system or across my desk do we give you resources versus up front? The prison system does not rehabilitate. The prison system, it's like, I believe they feel as if, why would I want to really give an education to my cow? I need my cow to work. I need my cow to give me milk. I need my cow to plow the fields. So why would I, it is job security for my cow to stay here. Majority of people who are doing what they're doing, they're trying to survive. Now you just took everything from them, made them stay in the cage like an animal for years and years and throw them out the cage and say, hey, go, to, go back out there and play now. It's not gonna work, you know what I'm saying? America's most precious resources are our citizens and the most vulnerable, our returning citizens. Think about this, when American bald eagle is wounded, we spring into action to rehabilitate it. The bald eagle receives hundreds of hours of post-release rehabilitation so they can survive on their own once released. Yet, returning citizens are treated far less than a bird and given maybe a one-hour pre-release class after one or 40 years of being held in captivity. I think that one of the reasons people end up recidivizing or going back to prison is because they try to, I'm gonna say this, it's because they try to catch up instead of focusing on getting ahead. I think that it's difficult to rehabilitate the organizations of confinement in prisons because that was not really what it was meant to do. It was a house, that's it. And I think that if we want to continue to fund these billion dollar industries, of the prison system, they need to have be accountable to taxpayer dollars where people are not coming back in and out, in and out. And so there needs to be something tied to their funding to actually rehabilitating individuals that come in and out. You need a year of counseling when you come home from prison. You need real counseling, not, 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 not um, the halfway houses. You need to come out, put you back in the environment of your home, and you need to go to counseling for a year. And it shouldn't be no stress on you. Uh, it, it, you do need a job, but it shouldn't be no stress where I need a job to pay you. You need a job to get your life back on track, not pay you. I've already paid my debt to you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I went to court fees and all this, I lost. Then I served time, then I worked for you for 24 cents an hour. You know what I'm saying? I've already paid my debt to society. When I come home, I shouldn't owe you nothing. We shift the priority to say, okay, our number one focus is rehabilitation then that is what we anchor to. That's our mission statement. That, then that will drive your strategy, that will drive your behavior, that's gonna drive your results. But if we look at it today, our mission, the mission and the, the goal of prison is to fuel capitalism. So therefore, everything else that follows, your strategies, your behavior, the way you show up, the people you hire, the mindset, all of that is perpetuating that versus what one could argue the purpose behind the um, prison system is. If you don't provide an individual with the tools necessary to succeed, then you really can't be shocked when they fail, you know? <laughs> Cause it's kind of like, hey, what'd you expect?
We incarcerate as a nation more people than the country of China. That's a problem, but we're not safe. The average recidivism rate right now is 67% after the first three years of release. After seven years, it goes to 84%. So right now, every woman, man, or juvenile that steps out of prison, they will go back in some way, shape, form, or capacity within the first three years. But the bigger question is, what are we doing about it? Before I got released, they did do, uh, the federal system does have uh, pre-release classes and we did do some pre-release, but to me, was, to me it was unrealistic. They have this class, it was a two day class that we took. I don't remember the name of it, but it was a joke, truthfully. I mean, the only cool part was that you knew you were getting close to being released. You know, when you, when you got called to go to that class, like they finna let me out. But other than that, everybody was looking around, ready to go eat lunch and ready to end the day. That eight week program, pre-release program, was it sufficient to prepare a person who'd done anywhere between 15 and 35 years um, to return to society because if they weren't somewhat of a hardened criminal or a truly antisocial personality before they went to prison, after being in that environment for decades, they'd become antisocial, really, truly antisocial in a, in a very deliberate way, you know, um, because their survival was predicated on it those people are not prepared to return to society. We did have some tools available for people who wanted to take um, advantage of them. And I think that's probably where the justice, justice system um, has its shortcomings. There weren't any programs. Um, I decided myself, like listen to a lot of old heads, even though young, some things going in one ear, come out the other. Some of the older guys, they did have a lot of wisdom. They told me to make sure that I got myself together. I had to make a, a conscious decision in my mind to say, hey, do you want to be here? And I didn't want to be in prison. So I got my GED, in, uh, I got locked up in April of 97. I had my GED by August. So it was, it was that's, I'm, you know, just like that. A pre-release class is preparation for uh, uh, a returning citizen, as we say, not an ex-felon, that is leaving prison to be prepared for the outside world. If a man is in prison, or a woman, or a juvenile, is in prison, every year is 8,760 hours. So if a woman, man, or juvenile is in prison for 10 years, that's 87,600 hours, right? And most prisoners who leave that I've talked to, they might have had a one hour prison pre-release class. In my, my humble opinion, I think the minimum of a pre-release class should be 100 hours. 100 hours for an inmate or convict or whatever you want to call yourself to prepare you for being released. One, and that pre-release class has to have Credible messengers teach that class. They say if you want to be a master or expert, you have to put in 10,000 hours of being immersed in that discipline. There's 24 hours in a day, 8,760 hours in a year, and 87,600 hours in 10 years. So what type of person who spent one, five, or 10 years in a hypertoxic, masculine, ultra-violent environment will turn out to be a super criminal? Everybody knows if you want success or results, you have to be funded correctly. All things in America successful have a budget, oversight, implementation, and review of successes and failures. Yet our prison system gets a pass on rehabilitation when it's clearly stated in a mission statement. The mission has failed. I think the average person, regardless of the amount of time they did, if they were given the uh, time and attention of a credible messenger for a 365 day period, they would be far more likely to be able to remain free uh, and less likely to recidivate. Well, if that's the case, and we're saying that as a result of your activity and your behavior, we want to rehabilitate you, then the treatment, the therapy, the classes, the things that will help you become 
um, to help restore you should be mandatory. That should be the primary focus if that is the true purpose of creating the prison system. When you have broken people, right, concentrated in a building that now someone's telling you 24 hours a day, when you get up, when you eat, sleep, what you do, and it's just to house you, um, there's trauma. When you have uh, hurt people who are concentrated with other hurt people in a environment, it's another environment in prison that we really don't know because you have to survive. It's about survival in prison. And anyone who survives in prison is going to come out. They're not going to be the same. They're going to be addicted. They're going to be the most traumatized people. And now we say, hey, go back and better do everything right else you're going back. And most people who have been through trauma like we can't even imagine are going to go back because guess what? You are institutionalized. In any instance, if you're trying to convey a message to a person in a certain condition, in order for the person, no matter how viable the information might appear, if the person cannot relate to you um, because they feel that you have common experiences, the information will uh, fall on deaf ear because they won't trust you. It's like, I hear you, uh, Mr. DEA agent, you know, um, but you want to lock me up, though. You know, if I make a misstep, you want to lock me up. So um, as apprehensive as I believe you are about me, I am about you. When you say, I feel like a Martian, I am hurting. I feel fear about getting out. I don't know what to do. I haven't hugged my mother in 10 years. I haven't shook hands with another human being in 10 years. I don't know what an email account is. Resume is something that's French to me. I think it's a French word. I can't spell it. I've never had a job. I've never been on a job interview. I've never, ever had a bank account. I've never had a check in your name. America, how many checks have you had in your name? How many direct deposits have you had in your name? The demographic and the people that I'm talking to, they don't understand the perspective from a prosecutor. They don't understand the per perspective from a DEA agent because these are the main people who want to put me back in prison. It is their job. They get paid for it handsomely. If you don't have somebody that has been in the machine, that's got out of the machine and been successful and has had failures, how could you ever fix the machine? The pre-release class that I received in prison did not prepare me in any way, shape, form, or fashion for release. It was a complete, utter waste of time. And I think it was some fluff to say we offered a pre-release class. There were people here who were not, you know, social workers who'd come with a beneficent intent but not have an understanding of what was really going on. Killer Mike and T.I. and Two Chains on his wedding day. Thank you for that, bro. Um, and um, David Banner and Pusha T, and they all did videos um, saying, you know, my big homie Cabario asked me to speak to you guys, uh, you people, uh, brothers and sisters, because we went to male and female prison, and uh, to speak to you and, you know, and you know, give you words of encouragement, so forth, whatever. And that went a long way, you know, in terms of getting them to pay attention and um, to respect what we're saying. So we brought legitimacy and we brought this um, validation and that gave us the, the trust. Plus they realized, some people started realizing that's the guy that created Don Diva magazine. And so they understood the stories that I shared and so forth, whatever. So that gained, that helped us to gain the trust. I believe that the only way that pre-release would be effective is if the BOP allowed people who had the experience that the men that are incarcerated had, that they'll be able to give them an expectation. Because in life, you can't have an expectation without experience. And that's what led men like myself to prison. Our, exp our expectations is only based on our surroundings. So I never had an experience of somebody making hundreds of thousand dollars legal. I think if, if the criminal justice system was really interested in reducing recidivism, then there are certain 
steps on the back end that should become mandatory that would prevent somebody from reoffending. And the main thing would be to make it mandatory that this person gets some kind of skill. So they told us that there were all these different programs and things of that nature, but when I came home, reality hit and none of that existed. Listen, when it's time for you to go, it's time for you to go. There's no, uh, 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 there were no things for like any mental uh, evaluation to see whether or not you ready for society. I think instead of a optional, I think it should be more mandatory, you know? Cause it's like, hey, it's there for you if you want it, but some people don't even know they need it. They don't know they should want it. We have to make sure we give people the ability to come back out with training, with education, with some sort of being able to reassimilate into the community to be successful. If you have any feeling for humanity, then you want every human to have a certain baseline level of existence. And the only way you can do that is to pro provide that for everybody. And that's not, that's, not what, that's not what happens right now. Correction would come in the form of information, education, you know, investment um, in, into the person that um, would gain a greater understanding of what their, what the catalyst for their criminality is. Until we take a hard look at whether or not we really want reform, because reform means there's going to be some uncomfortable changes, you know? And until we decide that we're ready, we really want those uncomfortable changes, the system's going to be the system. It was not designed to rehabilitate. And that's where the rhetoric of the law and order, tough on crime approach and the war on drugs, which has decimated communities around this country, where black and brown people have, have lived. That's the, and we already hear, that's the failed policy that even legislators today say we made a bad choice. It shouldn't be a privatized, it shouldn't be a for-profit business. There shouldn't be a, a connection between how, how many prisoners you have, and meaning free labor and all of the different contracts that are available to these prison systems. Congress has to pass laws it has to be signed by the president. It has to trickle down to law enforcement. It has to go to prosecutors departments. It has to go to the prisons so that they can have things in place to help people not come back, which is kind of counterintuitive. Every business wants more business. Every business wants to grow. Prisons is a business. Prosecutor's office is a business. It's just a governmental business, right? Law enforcement wants to catch people and keep up with their quotas. No hate towards law enforcement, but they have a job, right? And the prisons don't want less people because now their budget, who wants their budget? Name one company in the world that wants their budget cut. Name one company, whether it's profit or nonprofit, that wants to make less money. Prisons are designed to house and combine people and uh, supposedly rehabilitate people. But rehabilitation is nowhere near an equation, except for maybe that two hour class. If you really are, want to re rehabilitate people and give people opportunities to thrive, you know, we're not the worst of what anyone has done. We have to give them the ability to, to get those records off. And I believe that after periods of time, your records should be clean. If you look at some of the European systems, um, Sweden is one of them, Germany is one of them. You can't ask about somebody's prison history. You know, if you come home, that's all you are forever. The main focus of prisons in Sweden is that of rehabilitation of the prisoners. The rehabilitation method is achieved through giving the inmates sufficient library access, access to the universities, apprentice courses, and learning a wide range of vocational skills. I believe that the system is set up to make people reoffend because if I've paid my debt to society and you put a label on me as an ex-felon, which hinders me from advancing in most areas of life, it's set up for me to return back to prison. Being placed in circumstances that look more like college than, you know, prison, right? So that they would get an opportunity to see 
where where the value in that is because they the reason that they do the things they do that are antisocial is because they have no value system that uh, incorporates normal societal behavior even have a uh, uh, apartment you know um, you know circumstance where you know at a certain level you know you're still incarcerated but like you're being put into circumstances that look more like normal society. A lot of these guys never had a home of their own. They went to prison at 17 years old, right out of their parents' house, you know what I mean, or uh, somebody's house. And then they went to jail, and then they grew up in jail, and they know nothing about having an apartment, having a bank account, having a job, nothing, nothing at all. If you really want somebody to, to, to do differently, you have to kind of allow them to. You know, I mean, if you, if, you, if, you, if, you don't, if you don't allow them to, it's like, what do you expect? Like, I mean, you know, you, you, you go and quote unquote pay your debt to society, then you shouldn't come out with the same hindrances that you do now because you have supposedly paid your debt. The ways in which the parole system and all the other control systems that are put into place for a person as returning to society contributes, in my opinion, to uh, the, the, the higher potential of recidivism is that they frustrate and limit the person. They tell you to do this and do that and do this, but then there's the rules that you can't do this, can't do that, can't do this, which limits your ability to do the things that you're mandated to do in order to maintain your freedom. Even once you've served your time, once the, you have legally been free from probation, you are still being treated as a second or third class citizen because you don't have full access to what the United States government has said that you have just by being born in this country, your birthright. Self-preservation is the first law of nature. And that preservation was the reason most men and women ended up in prison, not because they were bad people, not because they wanted to do crime, but because the surroundings that they were around, the, their surrounding environment didn't give them an opportunity to have anything. So if you take all my food away and you got food, I'm gonna take it. If, if I need clothing, I'm gonna take it. So when a man comes out of prison and you say you, got, you can't work, you can't um, feed your family. What does he have left? To preserve by taking and doing whatever he has to do to survive. You can't go back to your dreams because you now are stamped with, you're a convicted felon. Um, my dream was always to be an attorney. It's very difficult for people who have any kind of record, a felony, a felony, a felony record to get a job. And that's also a problem. It should be automatic from some of these types of crimes that if you serve your time after a period has passed and you do some things, your record should be clear. I love my family so and friends. Those same friends and family, that life ain't changed because because you went to prison. They still in the street, so they still doing what they got to do and, and that's a violation. My brother could could be a felon and not a judge telling me I can't even be around my own brother. Half of my family are convicted felons. My grandma, granddaddy convicted felons. So you tell me I can't even go home and be around my family or I'm going back to prison. You can't fraternize or be around felons. And then from my particular instance, my father's a felon, my brother's a felon, my mother's been locked up. Almost all of my male cousins and some of my female cousins have been locked up and have done prison time. Where am I gonna go? If, I, if I've been in prison, say somebody's been in prison 10 years, who wants you? Who's gonna take you? Where are you gonna live? I believe that not being a gun owner or making ex-felons not be able to own a gun is a controlling mechanism. You mean that everybody who has ought towards me can carry and have a firearm, but if they come into my house, I can't even do the simple thing of protecting my family as a man. So it begins to reduce you as a man to think that I can't provide or protect my family. Me being a business owner, I can't apply for federal uh, funding. I can't go into some federal buildings. So if there's a contract at the uh, USDA that my business could possibly make millions of dollars from, because when I fill out the application, I'm an ex-felon, I'm automatically dismissed from it. 
97% of my cases are pleas. So that means people voluntarily plead guilty to a felony or misdemeanor. And most people are going to prison for technical violations of probation and parole. And the ironic thing is that once you even have a record of any kind, whether you plead guilty or not, that arrest can weed you out of housing. That arrest can weed you out of jobs because they can see that arrest. I literally was living in um, Brookhaven when I first came home. They found out I was a felon on the lease and they, they evicted me. They terminated, they terminated my lease and said, no felons can be in this building. My PO at, at the time, didn't want me to stay in a good neighborhood. She didn't want me to stay in a nice, like I live in Buckhead. I've been living in Buckhead since I moved to Atlanta. She wanted me to live in you know, Cascades or Decatur somewhere in the hood. She's like, you supposed to be in the hood. Why? Because I went to prison. I'm not supposed to be in the hood. In Georgia, the way the laws are set up is people can carry guns. They don't have to just keep them in their house. If I got into a car with someone who had a gun license, it is pretty much a 90 plus percent chance if we were pulled over, that gun becomes mine now. And I was just getting a ride, going to the store or going to Walmart because I needed some things. The reason that gun is my gun is because it's an easy case. Because I can't be knowingly or unknowingly around anyone who has a firearm. So if I get in that car, now there is a great, great chance of me being violated and going back into prison because I simply needed a ride to Walmart to pick up some shampoo for my hair. And because we got pulled over and that officer says, it's an easy case. He was really having this person in the car so they could drive because this felon or returning citizen, that's really his gun because he has a tendency to do that. Even though we don't know him to do that, he made a wrong choice at one time. So now that gun becomes mine. Or if we find drugs in that car, it could be in a 15 passenger van. I'm all the way in the back. Those drugs are found on someone. Those drugs become mine now because I've got a drug conviction. I'm just in a van. And because I've had a drug conviction, uh, they believe that the propensity for me to have drugs is like, hey, you were with organized crime? You made that person do that. Like, unbeknownst to me that something could happen, it's always gonna be my fault. There's no really second chance. So it's designed to keep us going back into the cycle because self-preservation is the first law of nature. If I can't provide, I'm gonna take. I believe people re-offend re because they weren't given the proper tools to begin with. That's probably what ended them there to begin with. So you're throwing them right back into the environment with no transitional uh, resources to make them a better citizen. I had to learn that my freedom is priceless to me and I can't allow somebody else to threaten that or jeopardize that. Meaning, an argument for me instantly means if I'm with this particular person who I know is off or crazy, I'm gonna call your PO or I'm gonna call the police. So when you call the police, I'm the first one to go. He's a felon. He used to deal with drugs and have guns. Who's going to prison? If we would have been given more tools, if these young girls who were 20 years old, if they were given tools on why it's important to value yourself and love yourself or just anything, let, let me know that even though I'm in your facility that I still matter in this world because they treat us as though we don't. And so I feel like a lot of people come home and they reoffend because what are you coming home to? I would implement uh, prevention over incarceration. Most people don't deserve to have their humanity and their freedom stripped away from them. Um, very few cases is that necessary. I made a permanent decision in a temporary place for some called prison that when I got out, I wouldn't put myself back in. I made that decision and said, I can't go around these people under no circumstances, right? And if I rode in a car with somebody, the first thing I would ask is, hey, you got a pistol in the car, any drugs or any large sum of money? They all laugh, but then they'd be like, yeah, I got the pistol in the car, I'm cool. I would rather walk a thousand miles barefoot in the rain than walk one step on the prison track. Then the other thing that I did is I said, positive people, positive places usually results in a positive result, right? So I said, Whatever my faith-based center was, I've never seen anybody go to prison from church to synagogue to, or to mosque, right? So I said, 
I would channel my energy in those directions and be associated with those people because I know I can get services at a church, I can get clothes at a church, I can get food at a church, right? And I can get the word of whoever you perceive as God from the church too. I've been home 24 months. If I had to talk to a woman today in prison, I would say, please do not give up. Take me as your leading example if you need me to be, to know that life is not over until you decide to stop living. That you have an option to do better. They have books there. Even if they don't tell you what books to read, don't read any hood books. Only read books about how to enhance your mind. Don't, don't, don't engage in the ignorance. If somebody's fighting, you don't need to know all the details as to why. You just need to be cool with everybody that's on a compound. Speak to everybody. Work out. Um, drink your water. Get your water jug. Drink about six of them every single day. Stay focused. Write down what it is that you want to do because everything I'm doing right now, I wrote it down in my notebooks. I still have them with me to this day. So manifest, pray, drink your water, work out, keep your mind because that's what they want to take from you. I managed to stay free by being focused on every day as a day to get ahead. I'm not trying to catch up to my past or have the exact same thing, but I understand that I'm moving and progressing forward in life. The value of freedom is uh, priceless because when you're incarcerated, you have no access or no influence over anything. You've lost all, you, you've basically been reduced from being a human being to being a subject. One thing I would encourage men that are incarcerated is why you're incarcerated. Learn to hate what led you to incarceration. And then when you're free, learn to love that in which you have more than you love that in which you lost. I didn't reacclimate to society, and I think that's one of the reasons I've survived and stayed out this long, if we're going to be honest. I realized that I didn't want to go back. I also realized that my only option was to go back. And that's a really difficult thing. You know, I don't want to breathe air anymore. Okay, try to stop. I know that one of the things that I accredit to me being successful, as I am, and at this point I'm extremely successful, um, is my ability to always bet on myself and rely on myself, not using the excuse of they didn't do this or they didn't do that for me. Okay, what's the game we're playing? Oh, these are the rules. You start with all the money, you start with all the power, you start with all the decisions, and I gotta figure out how to get some chips. All right, well, if that's the rules we're playing by, that's the rules we're playing by. It's unfair, it's not right, it's unequal, but those are the rules that are established at this point. And we can discuss in a philosophical manner all day long what we should do to make the rules of the game be different. Or we can talk about true, sensible, practical things that keep you out of prison. You have to identify your toxic traits. You have to understand what it is about you that makes you do what it is you do. Learn to use your toxic traits to your advantage. One of the most important things is your conversations. The conversations that you have in your personal time are going to determine your success in your business. Just believe in yourself, put in the work, and provide a service, and you'll be successful. It's essential that you make the constant pursuit of information an aspect of your existence. This is how you live constantly. You have to be, you have to be sound in your in your process. Your process is all you actually have. Even if it, an aspect of your process is to defer to other people, that's still your process. Because at the point in which you take the uh, insight or recommendations of another person, that's you making a determination about the value of that information.